Well, as they say, all things must come to an end. And this chapter will focus on the end of the European empires. So, sorry for the crappy map, but uh, if you can see a lot, the Asian states would often get decolonized earlier than, well, at least, well, at least in some, some of them would get decolonized earlier than their than African states. Many of these end up gaining independence in the in the in like the years literally right after World War II. So. One of the big one of the big decolonization events was the decol was the independence of India. Throughout before India got its independence in 1947, uh, throughout the 30s, the Indian National Congress, led by Gandhi along with the Muslim League, compelled Great Britain to gradually move India towards the self-rule direction. After World War II, because Britain is just literally broke, uh, because they, they having been completely destroyed by the Second World War, they grant India independence. However, the Muslim Muslims feared a minority status. This could be attributed to the fact that British would you would often would often uh, use Muslims as their rulers and rulers and representatives and whatnot in order to fo in order to, as part of their divided rule strategy, which they would foment ethnic tensions. As a result, these Muslims, Muslims pushed for a separate Muslim state. The biggest, the biggest proponent of this, proponent of this was the Muslim League, like you know, led by Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the father of modern Pakistan. This idea, you know, basically, you know, this basically is the example of communalism, an ideology which permits religious identity over national identity, basically South Asian sectarianism. So, like I said, Ali, Muhammad Ali Jinnah leads the Muslim League, and Jawaharlal Nehru leads the Congress Party. Gandhi had been Gandhi. Now you wonder. Now you're wondering where's Gandhi? He gets shot by a Hindu extremist. Why? Well, here's what happens. So, in 1947, the British partitioned India in a. It's a very long story, but let's just say they just completely bungled up. But anyway. Um, the result, the resulting partition, creates ten million refugees with with five hundred thousand to a million. We don't know for sure. Dying in the ensuing violence. You want to know why this happened? Just look it up. So, basic, and you know, a lot of these, a lot of those, you know, brutal violence were based on religious lines. Gandhi would be heartbroken by this and would try to go on hunger strikes and. And a preach for reconciliation with the Muslims. A Hindu, a certain extre Hindu extremist didn't like it. Got a gun and shot him. And yeah, not fun. No, no, no good. So in 1947, like you know, literally right after, like you know, a few months after independence, India and Pakistan would fight. You know, India and Pakistan, the two countries created out of the partition, would fight a war over the province of Kashmir. Pakistan would get the aid of the U.S., while India would get the aid of the USSR. India and Pakistan became, Pakistan became Dominion members of the British Commonwealth and e retained English as the, in the first official language. So yeah, this is just like one result of the partition. This is a picture of Muslims leaving India. What happened was with the partition, you had, because of these arbitrarily drawn borders, millions of people were left inst or or in instantly became minorities in their own st in their own state. You know, Muslims in India and Hindus in in, the in Pakistan. So they would like flee across. So each so groups from both sides would flee across the border, and, and chaos ensued. So Nehru, the prime minister now the prime minister of India, first prime minister of India, warned of the dangers of newly independent nations getting caught in a superpower tug of war, a cold war. He he offered he offered the third path, an alternative to aligning with either the so U.S. or the Soviet Union. He creates the he India be lead, becomes a leader in the non alive movement, basically a movement of various countries who maintain formal neutrality. This is set. This is established at the Bandung, Con Bandung Conference, what one person would call the first international conference of colored people. However, this was more theoretical than real, as many countries in the non-aligned movement would seek help from the superpowers. It ends up happening. So after World War II, the, the Vietnamese declare independence. Now the French are like, no, we want to keep you because they had lost the Second World War and they were humiliated. So they thought, okay, well we gotta, we have to, you know. We have to get a military victory to, you know, cure our black eye. It fails, as Ho Chi Minh, a communist leader, mounts a, br a very successful guerrilla war and defeats France in 1954. Vietnam is defeated, de excuse me, divided at the 17th parallel of the 1954 peace conference in G Geneva. The, China, the Chinese and the USSR support the North, 
while the U.S. backs backs the South, South's leader of DM. Unfortunately, this guy was DM was neither government was really great. The North was a brutal communist regime, and DM was a dict was a tyrant and a corrupt mate was a corrupt tyrant. This unfortunate this pattern of supporting awful leaders would repeat itself quite often. A civil war would la later ensue between the northern communists and the south and the southern and the southern uh, American backed uh, Vietnamese. This conflict would become enmeshed in the Cold War. So this is basically, you know, like uh, a picture of the Vietnamese protesting French occupation. So now initially the US was sincerely advocating for anti an anti-imperialist argument they had they were they basically told britain and france back off after britain and france like after the after those two former colonial powers tried uh attacked egypt for do attacked egypt after nasser the president of egypt nationalized the suez canal but and they and the u.s had also granted the philippines in, in, in its independence however this u.s and the risk Sentiment gets trumped by you know the by fears of the domino theory containment. Keep in mind, domino theory wasn't completely wrong. I mean, it makes sense if one country falls to communism, it's probably going to end up spreading it to the other with revolutions, propaganda, whatever. Uh, however, what the U.S. failed to understand was the fact that really the Vietnamese to the Vietnamese they didn't really view it as a communist conflict. They view they viewed it as a national struggle, national struggle for liberation. That's why that's why the North Vietnamese were willing to fight so hard. So Lyndon B. Johnson uses this mind, this you know, t uh, t uses a Tonkin Gulf incident, probably fictitious, mostly it was fictitious, to massively escalate the Vietnam War. However, Ho Chi Minh wins, you know, the, he the, wins using the same tactics he, he used against the French, and Vietnam is unified after a brutal war in 1976. And we get to this. Oh dear. So the U.S. So it now FYI, this issue like. There's no objective sources about it, so you might want to, you know, do your research, both sides, just low recommendation, but here we go. This is what the AP World H Curriculum says. So, the, it all starts with the UK pro proclaiming support for the Jew for a Jewish homeland in the state of pa in the British Mandatory Palestine, in the British Mandate of Palestine. As we can see this, we saw this in the Balfour, like, you know, they said, they said so in the Balfour Declaration 1917 and the Versailles Peace Conference in 1919. Palestine, keep in mind, it was carved out of the Ottoman Empire, it, and this. Now, now, um, why did they do this? You know, it was a divide and rules, divide and conquer strategy, trying to exacerbate ethnic tensions between Arabs and Jews, as well as the fact that UK was kind of desperate. Um, they also, uh, ironically, were motivated by anti-Semitism of all things. Basically, you you might have heard of the. And the really terrible anti-Semitic stereotype the trope of you know Jews control banks, Jews control the world nonsense. The UK, like many UK leaders, actually believe that. So they thought, okay, if we support you know the Jews, you know the Jews' uh, quest for a homeland in Palestine, maybe we could get their powerful support. It just makes no sense. But anyway, uh, Palestine was ruled by a great Britain between the wars. Uh, you get a growing Jewish slash Zionist immigration from Europe. The Arabs are like, uh, we don't like this in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and now initially the British do respond to, do respond to Arab protests by cutting off immigration to Palestine in 1946 with the white in the late 1930s with the white paper. Now, FYI, this is when Hitler's in power. So ironically, the so. You know, pretty so. Unfortunately, the British end up cutting off immigration to Palestine when the Jews needed the most. After World War II, the Arab states increasingly gained independence, such as Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, and Jordan. And now the question is, should Palestine get independence? So, this is basically a demonstration of Palestinians against the Balfour Declaration. They viewed uh, it as another, you know, machination of Western imperialism. You know, they thought, hey, why are you stealing our land? It's like I said, there's no unbiased books or videos on this, but oh well, I'll try my best. Oh well, let's try this. So, so Jewish and Arab pressure drives the British to hand Palestine over to, to the newly created United Nations for a resolution because the British were like, okay, this is bad. We don't know how to deal with this. So the UN comes with the Partition Plan of 1947, which divides J the land into two equal states: one Arab, one Jewish. Jerusalem, a, whole, a site holy to both Muslim, to both Ar to both Arabs, regardless of their religion, you know, Christian, Jew, or Christ, uh, or um, Muslim, or Muslim, and Jews. So the city was institute internationalized. So both, so both sides could share it. 
Uh, oh, sorry. This looks looks like this guy looks like this got meshed meshed into one. Now this could happen because of the Holocaust. People are just like, oh my God, this is horrible. We better, you know, we feel really terrible for you know these Jews, which is a you know obvious, you know, who wouldn't do? I mean, who wouldn't think that? I mean, if you don't, I mean, like this this was just, this was one of you know this was the crime of the century. So 1940. So that uh, so 1948. Hold on, let me try to uh, you know space that out so in 1948 uh you know oh shoot oh gosh uh sorry i'm going to need to correct it hold on sorry um let me see so yeah i mean like i mean just the sheer like horror of the holocaust like shocked many people to thinking oh god they really deserve the jews really deserve this land which i mean it's a I mean, like, come on, who wouldn't think that? I mean, these, this was just a awful, awful, like, thing that just happened. Um, now, basically, the Jews accept their sliver of land and declare the independence of the state of Israel. The Jews had basically said, we will accept literally a postage stamp of land, and we just want this. But the Arab states are like, absolutely not. They reject the loss of any land, but the, and so they invade Israel, but then get crushed. Um, to this day, the Palestinians refer to this the arrival of the Israelis as the Nakba or catastrophe. So, ugh. so, so, Israel and its Arab neighbors will fight a second war, the Six Day War, in June 1967. Nasser of Egypt would take a leadership position in the Arab world, promoting pan-Arab nationalism. He attempts to block the Suez traffic, knowing this would piss off Israel. And he threatens invasion of Israel in 1967, but Israel says, uh uh, you're not gonna do that, and launches a huge, uh, a very successful preemptive attack. They managed to conquer and annex East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights. They also conquered the Sinai Desert, but they returned to Egypt later on, in, like, you know, after the Yom Kippur War in 73, in order to get Egyptian recognition of Israel. Now, the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, V, as well as the, as well as the, uh, Golan Heights, their status remains unresolved. So basically, basically, this is a map of, you know, the territories of, you know, territories that Israel gained and later gave up after its wars between 1949 and 1982. So, yeah, not very, very controversial stuff, to say the least. So, in Africa, you had a 19th century scramble for Af Africa. And as a result, and as a result, a very deep legacy of colonial competition. There were also deep internal divisions, many of many of them exacerbated by colonial powers. They were tri primarily tribal, ethnic, linguistic, and religious. So France goes like, okay, we're broke. Let's just abandon most of these territories. As we can see, in 1956, Morocco and Tunisia gained independence, as well as 13 other colonies in 1960. This is why, like, 1960 is called the Year of Africa. But there's one colony they don't want to hand over, Algeria. Algeria, like one reason was Algeria had been a French colony for much longer. It had been it had been colonized and it had been you know absorbed and annexed by France in 1830. As you also had the fact that you had two million French citizens born or settled in Algeria by World War II. These were these are known as these were known as Pied de Noir, Pied de Noirs, and they were very very white supremacist. The most famous being noir, by the way, is Albert is the French offer French existentialist author Albert Camus. So 1954, the Fronte de Liberation, Liberation Nationale, I'm probably pronouncing that so badly, begins a guerrilla war against France. Now, now there had been a simmering conflict since the French massacre at Setif in 1945. Uh, you had this conflict rapidly escalates as as by 1950 you have 500,000 French soldiers in the war, 250,000 Algerians are killed and 25,000 French are also killed. Ugly stuff. The war ends with Algeria independence in 1962. Well, and this Algeria independence ends up provoking a massive, you know, massive refugee crisis as the PN is like, oh crap, we're gonna get treated like, oh crap, we're scared, and they basically flee. Uh, two, you know, basically every one of them, all two million, creates a refugee crisis in France, and it's, yeah, a mess. Also, yeah. Now, with the, with the independence of Africa, you get this rise of the idea of negritude, or blackness. Basically, it had, it, it, the whole notion is, 
you know, black is beautiful, you know, as we would say in the U.S. It was a revolt against white colonial values and a reaffirmation of reaffirmation of African civilization. You know, it would often be connected with socialism and communism, basically anything that was anti-imperialist. So the Gold Coast slash Ghana would lead the way in terms of independence in sub-Saharan Africa. Kwame Nkrumah, the George Washington of Ghana, at least in, in a you know, and a leader of failed pan Africanism would become the first president, uh, the, the first president of an independent country. He was initially peaceful and tried to initiate, uh, uh, tried to initiate economic success for state uh, state run policies. But later he became, but he became increasingly dictatorial. He would celebrate the visit of. Queen Elizabeth II, 1961, affirming Ghanaian, Ghanaian independence and equality. So, you know, this is basically cr the Kuruba leading independence celebrations. So, Kenya, however, was pretty was far more violent. The QQ, the Kukuyu ethnic groups begin ethnic group begins attacks on British settlers and collabor and colla and African collaborators in 47. The settlers labor Kukuyu as communist terrorists and they declare and a state of emergency is declared in 1952. An overwhelming British military you know, the British respond with overwhelming force, resulting in the death of 12,000 Africans versus 100 than Europeans. The whites won the war, but uh, the whites won the battle, but they end up losing the war. Uh, eventually, you get a bloody but negotiated withdrawal of independence in 1963. However, sadly, many Indians who lived, who were who settled, who were brought to Kenya as cheap labor, or forced to leave. So yeah, this is basically the independence of Africa in the, in the 1960s, in like in the decolonization of Africa. As we can see, a crap load in, 50, in the in the 60s, you know, as the Cold War's heating up, and everyone's like, "Yep, this is not, yep, this just doesn't make, yep, this is not, a, this is not affordable." <coughs> so in China, you had uh, communists, uh, massive pervasive policies of so economic and so cultural engineering under. Under under Chairman Mao Zedong, you had the disa two disastrous programs. First, the Great Leap Forward, the Great Proletary Culture Revolution. Um, you know, millions of die, millions of people died both in both these. You know, China loses its best its best its intellectuals. Yada yada yada. Eventually, China is saved by Deng Xiaoping, who comes to power in 1978 after Mao dies, dies in 76. His figure is it doesn't matter if the cat is black or white so long as it catches mice. Basically, he brings in capital slash foreign investment and pulls 300 million people out of desperate poverty single-handedly. However, he is no, you know, he's no pro, de de he's no, you know, democracy guy. He, you know, he crush, he brutally crushes pros, pro-democracy Tiananmen Square rallies in 1989. His new, basically, as a result, got a new social contract. The quote unquote Communist Party delivers rapid growth in the people except soft dictatorship, although it's becoming more and more dictatorial as of now. So Nehru succeeds in the goal of establishing a socialist, non aligned democracy. However, Indian democracy would be extremely, would be badly damaged under his daughter, Indira Gandhi, who would declare a state of emergency. The Green Revolution, uh, basically, you know, all these nice agricultural advancements, increases agricultural yields, but also increased rural poverty. Ba to slow population growth, Indira Gandhi would basically implement mass forced sterilization programs. She would later get assassinated, be assassinated by C her Sikh bodyguards after she after a botched attack on a Sikh, Sikh extremist in Amritsar in 1984 on the Holy Golden Temple. Nehru's descendants would continue to rule as the Gandhi political dynasty, no relation to Mahatma Gandhi, until, until 2014 when they made opposition party, the BJP, takes power. So, the Cold War splits the Arab Muslim world. Nasser's pan Arabism failed because Arab cult Arabs not share a common enough language and culture. You also have the is Israel defeated the Arabs at 67 and 73. This greatly intensified the tensions in the region, but also led to long to a long series of peace negotiations. For example, Anwar Sadat of Egypt would later negotiate a peace treaty with Israel. Basically, and the U.S. order to make sure Egypt doesn't do something stupid would pay one billion dollars a year to Egypt. However, Sadat would be hated in Egypt for doing this, as he gets yes, he will be assassinated in eighty one by Muslim extremists. So, the Palestinian Liberation Organization served as the government exile for Palestinians displaced by Israel, and they are a terrorist organization. They are best known for the Munich for the Munich massacre, where eleven Israeli athletes are brutally murdered by black. Brutally, brutally, 
brutally murdered. However, later, Israeli Prime Minister Yitzka Rabin eventually signs a peace accord with PLO, chair, with PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat. This creates a new Palestine, Palestinian authority in the West Bank and Gaza. However, peace would not, however, this moment at peace fails as Rabin is assassinated by a far right Jewish extremist and, and Yasser would later die. So, yeah, this is basically a picture of one of the, uh, Basically, of, of like basically a picture of one of the terrorists who murdered these eleven Israeli athletes. Just this, ugh, awful. So, if you want to know, you know what it. So, you also get the rise of Islamism with the failure of Arab nationalism. People in the Middle East are thinking, okay, so nationalism didn't work, modernization didn't work. Okay, well, let's double down on what we do know: Islam. So. You get the rise of Islamism, or political Islam. Now, radical Islamism is known as Sharia. Violent Islamism is known as Jihadism. Jihad is, like, translates roughly to holy war, a struggle to protect the faith. Now, it can be, now, it, according to Islam, it can be both internal and external. Basically, an internal struggle to be a better, a, a better Muslim, but of course, we all, of course, it can also be external. Basically, like, you know, a rough analogy would be a crusade. So, you know, basically, this Islamism is a reassertion of Islamic values. The answer, every answer comes from Islam, as nothing else is working. As they are, like, you know, many, many nas hardcore nationalists are fed up with corrupt, dependent regimes supported by neo-imperialist crusaders. And, of course, the quote-unquote Zionist entity. This is basically a blatant example of anti-Semitism here, right? Like, you know, right here. You know, and uh, you know many and like many of the like many of these you know hardcore anti-Zionists would call visa would call Zionism as equal to racism. If you ever if you ever heard of that very inf that infamous UN general resolution, this was exacerbated by the resource curse. A lot of these countries had a crap load of oil, but just didn't know how to use them, and population explosion because medical technology was improving. So, 1953, the CIA supports the over. Supports the over, you know, basically support props up an Iranian Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. However, he is overthrown as he gets overthrown in the revolution of seventy nine because a he alienated conservative Shia Muslims with secular reforms. He, you know, for you know, he was a br he also used you know as we as we as we know he used CIA money to brutally suppress all the set with his own secret police force called the Savak. He also did try to, however, he also did try to, like, reform the country, so, and that kind of, and he went too, but he went too far. He also allowed Western companies to dominate the economy. So basically, you know, motto of the story, it's, it's Ayatollah time. So this is a picture of blindfolded U.S. diplomats during the 1979 hostage crisis in Iran, this would become one of the most defining moments of the revolution. And as we know, we all know that famous quote, death to America. And you know, this is a Time magazine picture of you know the of Ayatollah of Ayatollah Khomeini. You know, at the time he was a very menacing figure. So, however, Iran, however, Iran's revolutionary government wouldn't have much would need to get organized very quickly, as in, as a as they have fight a war would fight a war of Iraq very quickly, very early on. So, Iraq is 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 you know Arab, but it's it's. You know, it's secular. It's led by it's secular Sunni led, whereas Iran, it was mostly Persian and it was fundamentalist Shia led. Uh, Iraq's, you know, like Saddam Hussein uses oil and U.S. support to build a large military machine. Yes, the U.S. used to support Saddam Hussein. Um, Iraq attacks Iran, there, like you know, soon after the Shah was kicked out, hoping that the chaos of the revolution will make Iran weak. Turns out, it really turns out Saddam Hussein badly. Saddam Hussein badly underestimated his enemy. Uh, the war would drag on for another eight years, and it ends an exhausted stalemate with over one million dead. Hussein would later attack Kuwait, provoking the Gulf War. The U.S.-led coalition drives him out and imposes sanctions, but leaves him in power. In, however, in 2003, George W. Bush would later invade Iraq in search of the wep in search of weapons of mass destruction. He occupies Iraq, and Hussein is executed. However, the ensuing chaos that would follow would lead to the creation of ISIS, an un 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 for a very unfortunate, unintended consequence. So, Latin America after the Second World War is a group of conservative land-owning Creole elites. It also suffered from Yankee quote unquote Yankee imperialism, really just economic neo-imperialism. It also had it also had and still has the highest inequality in the world for a region that's not really rich in terms of you know materials now resources it's very rich it they it, the, the, these chronic problems would even drive some in the Catholic Church to liberation if 
Catholic theology, basically Marxism plus Christianity. This would later help push the Catholic Church in a more left-leaning political direction. It also did help the fact that they, during the Cold War, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. would also uh, do some crappy interventions that would lead to great suffering in Chile, Central America, Caribbean. Now, before now, I, now you now I wonder now you might be thinking, well, does this make us any much? Now, you're probably wondering. This probably like oh oh wow the Soviets don't sound too bad. Keep in mind this. Keep in mind the U.S. was fighting the Soviet U. The U.S. was against the Soviet Union for crying out loud. The Soviet Union is no paradise, no paradise. You know, brutal, you know, brutally crushing us dis dissidents. But I gotta admit, America did some pretty bad things. You know. Big examples, support of this, this you know, of Somoza and Nicaragua. So, you know, an example of of the woes of Latin America, some of Latin America's woes was Argentina had to suffer from awful, dirty wars under the military regime, you know, caused by military regimes, death squads in the 70s and the 80s. This was supported by the Americans. Not fun stuff. And uh, this made them, of course, this made them really, this made the junta very unpopular. So they thought, okay, let's let's do something really smart. Let's declare, let's start to, let's de let's see some island, let's let's just steal some British islands and uh, invade some British islands. Um, that did not that did not go well down with Margaret Thatcher, and she you, and basically British forces absolutely crushed Argentinian forces, and the defeat was so bad that the junta got overthrown. <laughs> Hey, I mean, who said the British, you know, hey, you know, the British can't liberate sometimes. So, however, however, now the Falklands War led to Thatcher being able to use Patriot, whip up patriots of the crush unions at home. Reagan would do the same thing as invasion of Granada. Now, Mexico is, now Mexico actually is doing okay. It still has a lot of, it still it's, it had and still has a lot of problems. However, it, however, it made a smart decision to nationalize the oil industry to ensure that the local people are getting the benefits of resources, not foreign companies. So Mexico is now a somewhat democratic middle-income nation. Brazil is also now making progress. So after decolonization, you had the Organization of African Unity formed in 1963 to prevent intervention from former colonial powers. It declared that the current that the that the borders would remain permanent. Now, despite the, despite their arbitrary neighbor, na nature, they were ne this was necessary to. For First all conflicts. The this organization would try to promote pan Africanism, but it failed to prevent ethnic strife. So one of the interesting cases of internal colonialism was South Africa. The you know more specifically apartheid and they, you know, apartheid. Eighty seven percent of the territory was owned by the whites and all and they they also control all the mineral industrial wealth. Africans were divided into tribes and settled in quote unquote homelands, you know. Basically, their version of Native American reservations. So, the African National Congress published the Freedom Charter in 1955, advocating for racial equality at the end of apartheid, but this has little impact. Um, however, apartheid will eventually end. The, a the ANC, or African National Congress, which is basically their version of the Indian National Congress, would become radicalized after the 1960 Sharpeville Massacre. Mandela, one of the main leaders, will be imprisoned in '63. However, the international community would later would impose successful sanctions against South Africa. Mandela is elected president in 1994 and pushed re reconciliation. Now, here's the weird thing: South Africa is the richest, most stable sub saharan nation, but things are getting really bad. As many of Man things are getting worse, as Mandela's successors were pretty crappy. So this is basically, you know, the, you know, the big hero, Nelson Mandela, you know, you know, you should, you know, he wrote an autobiography, uh, called Long Walk to Free, uh, called, I believe, I feel like the book here, uh, you know, Long Walk to Freedom, you should read it, it's good. So, so the optimism of decolonization would fade over time, as Sub-Saharan Africa was worse off in 2007, 2000, than in 1960. You had dozens of military coups and instability, little political pluralism, and artificial boundaries made national unity, making national unity much more difficult. You also have grinding poverty with exploding populations. Basically, you have, you know, you know, these, you know, Africans getting nice medical, you know, getting some modern medicines, which is good. But then the fact is their economies aren't growing much, so now you have all these workers without enough jobs for them. You also have no capital accumulation for infrastructure, which makes, you know, your economy that much more difficult to create. You also have a huge amount of foreign debt, you know, most, you know, most especially to China, as well as corruption, AIDS, and war. But since the millennium, things are actually getting better, you know. Many African, some African countries are growing quite well so yeah that's you know that's basically chapter 39